The strange drawings visible only from the air have been photographed by aerial survey, satellite, and the Skylab astronauts. The lines at Nazca, when added to the evidence of other sites around the world, indicates that the Earth may not merely have been visited by ancient astronauts, it may in fact have been colonized by them. There are marks that have been left by past civilizations to indicate the presence on Earth of explorers who came across the divide of space. Did those colonists inspire the legends of gods who came from the skies? Can we find the historic fact of their presence in the myths of ancient man? 100 years ago, an amateur archaeologist decided that Homer's Iliad was not myth, but history. He followed the epic account through the Aegean Sea to Asia Minor, and there he found the ruins of the lost city of Troy. legendary places contain evidence that converts myth to history, that supports tales of events so far beyond the range of normal human experience, they have for centuries been dismissed as allegory and legend. In the last 50 years, science has developed tools to date past events and probe ancient mysteries. So we are finding that old accounts take on new meaning. If we look for evidence that the Earth has had visitors from outer space, uh, the best book at this time we can use is the Bible once again. In the Bible, the Old Testament, the book of the prophet Ezekiel, gives us a very detailed account of uh, a visit, actually of several visits, of uh, extraterrestrial beings to this earth. As we left our tracks on the moon, so too must the ancient astronauts have set theirs on the earth. If so, where is the evidence of their presence? Where are the artifacts they have left behind? Perhaps the clues are not all buried in the past. Hi, right, Gemini 7 here, you in the 98? Loud and clear, 7, go ahead. I'll tell you at 10 o'clock high. This is Houston. Say again, Seven. So we have a bogey at 10 o'clock high. Roger. Chevy Control here again. The reference in that conversation was uh, bogey. It was uh, Borman who reported citing the bogey. Uh, this is Chevy Control in Houston at uh, 4 hours, 24 minutes into the flight. Bogey is the code word for an unidentified aircraft. But a bogey in space is almost beyond belief. Or is it? Presented by Timex, the dependable watch. Precision made to wear with confidence. Timex, the fashionable watch style to wear with pride. Two important reasons why more people buy Timex than any other watch in the world. The following program speculates on what might have happened. It is based on established facts, but it is not a news report. Ladies and gentlemen, John Cameron Swayze for Timex. In a minute, the Espadon is going to take a Timex Marlin watch for a ride in that surf out there. We've attached the watch to a ring on the front of the boat. Our driver is ready. Let's see if our Timex can take it. Every time that boat slams down, remember, our watch is right there. Laboratory 
test show the Marlin can withstand an impact of 2,000 Gs and still run accurately. Okay, let's see how our Timex did. There, it's still going. See the sweep second hand? You know the Marlin has to be rugged to take punishment like that. The famous water-resistant Marlin, ladies and gentlemen. Available with an automatic calendar or with a day and date indicator. And for smaller wrists, the Timex Sportster. Well, you saw it. No wonder more people buy Timex than any other watch in the world. The sun in our heavens will burn for another four billion years. Then it will expand to a red giant. It has happened elsewhere. Many suns in the universe have died. Somewhere in space, an advanced civilization may have seen the end approaching and begun the search for a new planet that could sustain life. We have come of age in space. Our own explorations tell us it is possible that man-like creatures might have come here in their quest for a place to regenerate life. If they had come from an Earth-like planet, this Earth would have been an ideal new home. And here they might have landed, in the mysterious Peruvian Andes, near a lake called Titicaca. From the shore, the outline of Titicaca has no pattern. Only when viewed from space does it take on the shape of a jaguar about to pounce. In the ancient language of the region, Titicaca means stone of the jaguar. Was it named by arriving space colonists? An arid mesa called the Altiplano fringes Lake Titicaca. On the barren windswept plain, the air is thin and corn does not grow. It is a harsh environment. Yet there is reason to believe that here long ago, a colony was established by visitors from another planet. It is possible that the first inhabitants of the Altiplano are our dim and distant ancestors. We may never know what actually occurred here. Most of the traces have been obliterated. The Inca, who dominated this part of the world, erased the histories of the regions they conquered. But in the mounds, rubble, and broken walls of an Andean plain lie the ruins of a once great city called Tiahuanaco. It stands mysterious and unexpected at 13,000 feet above sea level. It might have housed the most advanced civilization of ancient times. Long before the Inca arrival, Tiahuanaco was a reality. And the question arises, how much did the Inca take away in plunder, and how much in technology? The Inca did not build Tiahuanaco, nor did the ancestors of Indians who now live on this desolate mountain plain. Who did create this city? Estimates of its age range from 1,200 to 15,000 years old. Could Tiahuanaco have been built by colonists possessed of a technology far more advanced than that of man? This subterranean temple is not unlike an anthropological museum or the trophy room of some big game hunter. The faces show a bewildering variety of shapes and expressions. Some are familiar others alien, a range that covers the racial spectrum of man. Are these models of man or experimental designs for man? Grim helmeted carvings found in South America seem to trace their inspiration from the Tiahuanaco monolith. In 1927, the carvings were interpreted as an account of the Earth's original capture of the moon. The theory was dismissed as nonsense. But after seven Apollo flights, there has emerged a similar theory that the moon has wandered into our solar system only to be captured by the Earth. Of all the 
mysteries at Tiwanaku. None loom quite as large as a monolithic archway called the Gate of the Sun. Cut from a single block of andesite, it weighs at least 10 tons. Beyond the twin questions of how it got here and how it was cut by people who did not possess metal tools, is the mystery of the strange creatures that run across its face. For the carefully chiseled lines depict birds that never flew in the skies above the earth. The most arresting features are the eyes, which are composed of still another creature, figures barely discernible but nonetheless familiar to us as space-helmeted astronauts. No less mysterious are the eyes of the god atop the arch. Two tears are deeply etched into his cheeks, and no one can say why the sun god of Tiwanaku weeps. So it stands, a brooding, mysterious ruin atop a desolate mountain plateau 13,000 feet in the air. Was it built by those who came to make a new home of planet Earth? Three hundred miles away, on another plane, lie the strange lines of Nazca. Nazca may have been a landing field, a base camp from which ancient astronauts took off to explore the planet they had found. Perhaps, but the lines at Nazca, which take shape only when viewed from the air, might have another function, one directly related to space and suborbital travel. For these lines, radiating in all directions, look not unlike the route maps of a modern-day airline. Do they point the way to other outposts on the Earth, a route map for the Earth's original colonists? If followed, where will they lead? One line pointing east leads to a remarkable, unexplained artifact. 300 miles away. No one can say when the great stone of Saiwiti was carved, nor do we know what tools were used, but here it stands. Various interpretations have called it a sacrificial altar, a city plan, a map of the universe, and a model of colonial outposts on Earth, complete even to the agricultural terraces that make farming possible in the mountains. The terraces in the Peruvian Andes, for example, have been in continuous use for centuries. They reach upwards to the ruins of an ancient city, complete with temple, astronomical observatory, and a fortress to guard the crops. Did the founding colonists design these mountain stepping stones for settling the planet? Sacsayhuaman is a megalithic fortress presumably built by the Inca. The snake marks a stone so heavily magnetized it will cause a compass needle to spin wildly. Legend says the Inca kings received a special power from this stone. With it, their empire spread from the Pacific coast to the Amazon jungle, leaving a record of accomplishment wrapped in enigma. The Inca knew nothing of the wheel, and yet their roads are still in use today. They had no alphabet. Yet they developed an engineering technology that built structures such as this. Or did they? Were they creators or inheritors? Descendants or beneficiaries of a civilization and culture transplanted to the Andes from somewhere else? Sacsayhuaman is built of enormous blocks of stone, cut and beveled to fit together with micrometer accuracy. No one has even a clue as to how these blocks, some weighing more than 100 tons, were quarried, shaped, transported, and set into place. 35 feet underwater and 1,000 yards off the northern shore of the island of Bimini in the Caribbean, there is another wall. There's absolutely no indication of who might have built it, 
but the huge blocks bear a striking resemblance to the masonry of the Incas. Some scientists claim it is a natural formation and not a wall at all. But if ocean currents cut the stones in the sea bottom, did they also cut them at right angles to each other? The Bimini Wall is but one of many mysteries in the Caribbean region known as the Bermuda Triangle. Here, ships and planes vanish under circumstances that defy all logical explanation. Just after the close of World War II in December 1945, five Navy fighter planes vanished without a trace, leaving a mystery that remains unanswered today. Their disappearance has been the subject of a 25-year investigation by magazine reporter Art Ford. Well, a routine naval air patrol took off from the Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station. Five planes, 14 crew members, five different radios. After the planes were in the air a few hours, they vanished. Five radios did not give a coherent reason why they vanished. The men were never seen again. No wreckage of the planes was ever found. There was no radio contact after they were lost. A search plane went up after them with 13 men aboard with every bit of equipment necessary to find them. It vanished within seven minutes. Particularly significant in the case of the missing planes was the a radio transmission report that remains in the record in the archives in Washington. Lieutenant Robert F. Cox was flying out to try to find Flight 19. He said on the radio, what is your present altitude? I will fly south to meet you. And Taylor, who commanded Flight 19, replied, don't come after me. He was warning his fellow uh, flyers who were trying to rescue the plane, which they thought was lost, and he said, they look like they're from outer space. Don't come after me. More than a hundred ships and airplanes have been lost in the Bermuda Triangle, taking with them 1,000 lives. There is no explanation for the disappearances that have taken place in clear weather and calm seas. But now we have one more question. Is this the corridor to outer space? Did the first colonists plant a homing device, a navigational aid, under these waters, a beacon for spacecraft to home in on, that somehow interferes with our own navigational devices? because you forgot to wind it again, Alice. Yeah, I know. Here, Alice, maybe this will help. Oh, George, a new watch. Not just a watch, Alice. An electric Timex, Alice. You never have to wind it, Alice. It won't stop on you because you forgot to wind it, Alice. Maybe you'll be on time from now on, Alice. Oh, thank you, George. George, do you have the time? For as little as $30, you can give your wife an electric Timex. It just might make your life a whole lot easier. In the beginning, the Earth was a place of violent geologic change. Volcanoes thrust mountains upward. Islands were created and destroyed in the violent birth pangs of our world. In this same underwater volcanic cauldron, life may have had its beginnings. 
The principal basis of life is protein. The process by which life might have originated from inert chemicals is the subject of experiments by Dr. Sidney Fox at the Institute of Molecular Evolution at the University of Miami. What's happening here is a splashing on a hot zone where the temperature is above the boiling point of water of a mixture of amino acids, water, and other uh, volatile material. At this temperature, the water vaporizes, the volatile material leaves, and the small amino acid molecules join together to form long protein-like molecules. These protein-like molecules, or as we call them proteinoids, upon simple contact with water in the laboratory, uh, produce what is a kind of minimal cell. The product of Dr. Fox's experiments, cells born in the test tube, they challenge all traditional concepts of life on Earth. In our view, the formation of primordial cells on the early Earth must have occurred many times, many places. If the conditions were right, we see no reason why this process could not occur elsewhere in the universe. There are other theories that attempt to explain the origin of life. The Earth is 4.6 billion years old, but the universe in which it is placed is far older, perhaps 13 billion years old. Time enough for uncounted species to rise, create civilizations, and scatter them across the universe, reaching even the small out-of-the-way planet called Earth. Dr. Leslie Orgel is a biologist at the Salk Institute in California. He and Nobel Prize winner Sir Francis Crick developed the theory of directed panspermia, the idea that life on Earth was sent here by a superior civilization. Dr. Orgel. In the 19th century, there were two theories about how life could have got to the Earth from outside. One theory, which was due to Lord Kelvin in England, said that life arrived as a spore carried on a meteorite. And the other theory, which was popularized by Arrhenius in Sweden, suggested that a spore could have been blown directly from a planet on another solar system all the way to the Earth. Now, in the last 10 or 20 years, it's become more and more clear that these theories just won't work, that a spore coming from outer space would be destroyed by radiation long before it got here. And um, a meteorite probably could never escape from another solar system. Now, directed panspermia is a sort of last attempt to resurrect the theory that life could have come here from elsewhere. And the notion is that maybe life was deliberately sent here by a technological society on some other planet, probably in our own galaxy. If life had arisen on the Earth and evolved spontaneously here, it seems at least possible that we would have many very different forms of life competing with each other. In fact, we know that all living things have evolved from a single cell which inhabited the Earth about three or four billion years ago, and there don't seem to be any traces of any competitors of that sort of a cell. Now, there are perfectly normal biological explanations of this that don't call for anything magical or anything extraterrestrial, but even when all is said and done, it remains a little bit surprising that there isn't any evidence for other sorts of organisms than the ones we see. Now, if life had come from another planet, however it had got here, whether it came on a rocket or on a meteorite or as a single spore, we could understand very easily why there's only one sort of life, because we would all be descendants of a single ancestor, the one that happened to get here. If a rocket had crossed the reaches of open space and brought to Earth the seeds of life, then it is possible that the seed of man also traveled here, directed by intelligence from another planet. Did the primitive Peruvians also know of these origins? If they did, it would explain why they carved fertility symbols from only one material, meteorites. For thousands of years, Neanderthal was the most advanced primate on Earth and a logical ancestor of man. But Neanderthal suddenly disappeared 35,000 years ago 
and a new presence appeared on Earth, Cro-Magnon. So different is he from Neanderthal, most scientists cannot account for his presence. They know only that suddenly these creatures begin to walk the Earth. We are their descendants. But the question remains, are they descended from the stars? Or did they receive from some ancient astronauts the knowledge and tools that enabled man to rise above the other creatures struggling for survival on Earth? Do ancient drawings commemorate such an event? Furrows in the California desert are merely scratches when seen from ground level but from the air they take on astonishing shapes. They were formed by men who lived here thousands of years ago. Men who could not possibly have sculpted these images without some direction from an observer high in the sky. All over the world, men have cut, shaped, and gouged the earth to create images that could only be seen from the heavens. Thousands of years ago, someone carved remarkable earth drawings on the English hillsides. Were they placed there in tribute to some distant forebearer who came from space? Is that why man first turned his eyes upward toward the gods in search of his primal beginnings and in the process began to question and learn of the gigantic forces at work in the universe? Is that how man's first science, astronomy, came into being? In the ancient world, there were no more accomplished astronomers than the Babylonians. Their cuneiform tablets mark the phases of Venus, the four moons of Jupiter, and the satellites of Saturn. None of these bodies or events can be seen without a telescope, a device invented 3,000 years after the tablets were carved. In the shadow of the Acropolis stands a 2,000-year-old observatory called the Tower of the Winds. Among the best preserved of all classical Greek buildings, the tower had frustrated archaeologists for years with the mystery of what it once had held. An early Greek text spoke of an astronomical clock mounted inside the tower. But how did it work? What did it look like? No one could say until a Greek sponge diver found these clockwork gears in the sea. Scientists estimated the gears had been built about 80 BC. Moreover, they determined that these plates and dials had been part of an extremely complex piece of machinery that had in fact been mounted in the Tower of the Winds. Finally, they concluded that it was an astronomical computer used to calculate the motions of the stars and planets. A stone circle crowned Saxeo Woman. It may have been an astronomical calendar. No one knows precisely how it was used, but alternately, sun and shadow fill the boxes that compose its rings. The Inca called this the hitching post of the sun. With it, they marked the seasons, but it also had a religious purpose. It served to tie the Inca directly with the stars from which they claimed descent. And perhaps their claim was also made for all mankind. To some scholars, the world's oldest source of wisdom is in India. This chant is part of a spoken encyclopedia called the Veda. It is at least 5,000 years old and may represent the oldest body of technical knowledge known to man with references to television, atomic energy, and interplanetary travel. Committed to paper 400 years ago, it is still the target of intensive research by scholars such as Padmasri Sivaramamurti, the director of the National Museum of India.
in ancient India, as all over the world, they had a desire to travel in the sky. We have the aerial car of the god of light, Surya, mentioned in the Rig Veda itself. We have also the Pushpaka Vimana, the wonderful aeroplane that could carry any number mentioned in the Ramayana. A real aerial car managed by an engine, the rishis could transport themselves to any planet that they wanted because of their Siddhi. A force known as Siddhi was said to exist in the world of the ancients. Using Siddhi, they could transport themselves anywhere on Earth, into the skies, and finally to other planets. What was Siddhi? And who brought it to Earth? If the tales and images of space travel were limited to India, they could be dismissed as the product of overworked imaginations. But how then could we account for primitive drawings in the rocks of Indio County, California? In the 20th century, we accept the existence of spacecraft. What event could possibly have inspired this 14,000-year-old drawing of a spaceship landing on the Earth? On a rocky plain in the Andes called Toro Muerto, hundreds of petroglyphs depict the same scene. Our ancient figures with spacesuit-like costumes, the record of beings actually encountered And where did the Indians of Colombia find models for these golden helmeted figures sculpted more than 1,000 years ago? The same people molded these golden objects, which look startlingly like a modern Delta Wing jet fighter plane. Could flight have played a role in the construction of this rocky fortress in Peru? Called Ollante Tampo, it spans a pass through the mountains that link the jungle with the sea. The Inca builders were accomplished stonemasons who built a chain of fortresses across the Andes. Nowhere is there an explanation for the technology used to carry enormous pink slabs, each one more than 60 tons, from this mountain where they were quarried, across the river and valley, and then 10,000 feet up the face of Oriente Tambo. Could it be explained by a force known in ancient India as Siddhi? Cusco, once the capital of the Inca Empire, is a mixture of Spanish and Inca architecture. The walls of this street contain a stone that has 12 angles cut within it. So tightly do the stones fit that no mortar was ever used to join them together, and not even a knife blade can be slipped between the joints. The wall once formed a part of an Inca temple of the sun. The Spanish conquistadors used the walls built by the Inca as the foundation of a church. In 1950, an earthquake shattered Cusco virtually destroying the church. Today, the people of Cusco are still rebuilding the church atop the ancient earthquake-proof structure. The original walls, however, remain standing. Again, the question arises, did the Inca receive this building technology from the original colonists? The strangely knotted strings are called quipu. No one today can read them. But when the Spaniards first came to Peru, the Inca kings would call upon their rememberers who would consult the quipu and account for every kernel of corn and man, woman, and child in the empire. But the quipu were more than a numerical accounting system, for with it, an accomplished rememberer could call forth epic poems, historic dates, and events. The knots show how the decimal system was used in the quipu but added to them were colored threads that offered subtle nuances and shades of meaning that are forever lost to us. So sophisticated was the quipu, however, 
that some investigators believe it was the Inca version of a computer punch card. An enormous crystal was placed in a Mochica grave more than 1,500 years ago. It is among the hardest of all minerals, yet it was cut, polished, and shaped by a technology that theoretically could not have existed at that time. Other hands carved this skull. The British Museum calls it 15th century Aztec. But why would the Aztecs, who never created naturalistic art, suddenly render in crystal a skull? The bead is turquoise, another extremely hard gemstone. It is 1,700 years old and was probably part of a necklace or bracelet. The hole in each bead has a diameter of 0.19 millimeters. Even today, we can barely drill holes that small. The ibis is native to Egypt, but it was carved into an ancient stone printing roller found on the Pacific coast of South America, 8,000 miles from Egypt. These 1,500-year-old pottery figures form a portrait collection that depicts the races of man. All are separated by time and distance. And yet, somehow, the potters of an Indian tribe called the Mochica cataloged races they theoretically should never have encountered. was forged 1,700 years ago in India. It confounds the laws of metallurgy. Too large to have been forged in one piece so long ago, it is rust-free after 1,700 years. No less remarkable, although a mere 700 years old, is a rust-free iron tooth. Found in a Peruvian grave, it seemingly is as functional as any modern dental prosthesis. Other graves yield the suggestion that the ancient Peruvians were accomplished neurosurgeons. At the Cusco Archaeological Museum, Dr. Fernando Cabellesis, professor of neurosurgery at the University of San Marcos, demonstrates. These skulls here uh, are a, uh, just a very small sample of the tremendous amount of skulls that were found in the uh, graves of the ancient Peruvians. I think that uh, all in all, we have studied more than 10,000 skulls that uh, have been unearthed. Now, these are some of the instruments that they used. This is called the tumi, tumi knife, which was used this way, just to open the skull. This cannot be used in the bone they used to open the bone they use other bronze instruments like this just to pry up the bone like here prying up the bone there are some other odd instruments like this just to to make these indentations and there are at least two different uh, two dozen different uh, other instruments that were used also this one here it's a very interesting specimen. It shows a very persistent surgeon. You find here that this man suffered four operations, and he survived every one of them. Either it was a very sick man or, or a very persistent individual who operated on them. But he was a very good technician because, after all, these areas, especially these two openings are right over very, very dangerous sites that even right now, with all the techniques that we use now, we would just be very much afraid of operating in these sites. And this man really survived these operations. In Calca, near here, near Cusco, where about, I would say, 85% of these skulls show healed Trifonations, 85% of survivals from skull operations is a pretty good and excellent uh, result. 
at the Yerkes Regional Primate Center, scientists implant monkeys with electrodes. The experiment stimulates the brain with radio waves and thereby controls behavior. Are today's scientists seeking knowledge already gained by similar experiments performed centuries ago? Why do more people buy Timex than any other watch in the world? One reason is the electronic Timex. Put one on your wrist and you'll never have to wind a watch again. Because a tiny replaceable energy cell provides power for a full year. And instead of being expensive like many electronic watches, the electronic Timex costs as little as $25. And it's available in a variety of styles. It's even available in a style you can use as a clock. It's an electronic Timex in a high-impact styrene case with a 24-hour time ring. It has a special adhesive fabric so you can use it on the dash of a car, a boat, or in a private plane. Or you can use it as a desk clock. You can even remove it from its case and wear it as a wristwatch. It costs only $25. Or if you'd rather have an electronic Timex with an automatic calendar, there are several styles you can choose from, from only $30. You can even have an electronic Timex with a day and date indicator. Here are just a couple of the different styles available. Only $35. The electronic Timex. No wonder more people buy Timex than any other watch in the world. John Cameron Swayze for Timex. In 1947, a Bedouin boy found the first of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the caves of Qumran. At least 2,200 years old, they bring us closer to the original Bible than any other source and contain clear references to holy ones descending from the heavens. While biblical scholars study the scrolls for their theological implications, other scientists have looked to the Bible for evidence of extraterrestrial visits to the Earth. An aerospace engineer at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, Joseph Blumrich, has found in the visions of Ezekiel a technical description of a spaceship. The prophet Ezekiel describes four encounters with spaceships. At first he saw clouds, fire, and he heard noise coming out from the sky, out of the north. And as the vehicle approached, apparently it came rather quite in his direction, he observed what he calls living creatures. What Ezekiel calls the living creatures had straight legs and round feet or calves feet, sometimes they're called. And it was the description of these landing legs that made me take the book of Ezekiel serious from an engineering point of view. I have had the opportunity about 10 years ago to work with my group in my office in the, for the development of such a landing gear for an unmanned lunar landing stage. For that uh, hypothetical vehicle, we developed the landing gear and what we call the foot pan and what Ezekiel would call the round feet. Translating Ezekiel into engineering terms, Mr. Blumrich had these artist sketches made of a landing vehicle supported by four helicopter units. One of the interesting examples of Ezekiel's ability to observe and to describe are the faces he sees on these living creatures. He sees four of them, an oxen, an uh, eagle, a man, and so on. They are located at the top of these helicopter units and consequently they contribute <clears throat> to his impression of having some living creatures uh, in front of him. What they actually are is quite interesting. Now, some helicopters, and particularly in this case this one, uh, needs protection, just some hood around to protect them against dust or weather and so on. And such sheet metal structures will have 
cutouts will have humps in order to accommodate levers or rods which are below them. And they do have a distinct, they, they may have the distinct appearance of faces. We have uh, a number of such face-like structures, like for instance, uh, the Gemini capsule, then we have very interesting uh, feature that looks like a monster. And every one of uh, the audience will remember to have seen faces in rocks, in old trees and tree stumps. Jericho was built more than 9,000 years ago. Here man has lived continuously for a longer period of time than anywhere else on the face of the earth. And here remains one of the most puzzling of ancient mysteries. Great walls 12 feet thick made the city impregnable. But Joshua called upon his priests to blow their trumpets and the walls came tumbling down. But how? One theory holds that an earthquake tumbled the walls of Jericho, an earthquake that was part of an enormous planet-wide catastrophe. Around the world are indications of great disasters that might have caused the gods, themselves colonists on an alien planet, to flee impending doom. Did their departure inspire all the myths of Atlantis? Could there have been several colonies blurred by time into the one Atlantis first reported by Plato? Are legends, in fact, the histories of visitors from afar who colonized the Earth? Plato told of a fabulous kingdom that was then more than 9,000 years old. Whatever fragrant things there now are in the Earth, or woods, or essences which distill from fruit and flower, grew and thrived in that land, wrote Plato. They constructed buildings about them and planted suitable trees. Some of their buildings were simple, but in others they put together different stones, varying the color to please the eye and to be a natural source of delight. They had such an amount of wealth as was never possessed by kings and potentates and is not likely ever to be again. The entire area was densely crowded and kept up a multitudinous sound of human voices and din and clatter of all sorts, night and day. There were king's baths and there were separate baths for women and to each of them they gave as much adornment as possible. There were many temples built and dedicated to the gods, also gardens and places of exercise. Over the centuries, the people of Atlantis apparently succumbed to the greed that seems eventually to afflict all civilizations. Their actions must have angered the gods, for Plato tells of Zeus calling them together to inflict punishment upon Atlantis. And when he had called them together, he spake as follows. And here, Plato ends his tale in mid-sentence. But the people of Atlantis had been warned, and they fled the island in haste. must have spoken, for the island was shattered by what may have been the most powerful volcanic explosion ever known. Immense tidal waves and earthquakes followed the eruption. Scientists dated the catastrophe at approximately 1500 BC. This same chronology coincides with biblical and other accounts from all over the world that speak of or hint at incredible natural disasters. time, this island was known as Thera. Today it is called Santorini. Was it also once the site of the fabled empire of Atlantis? We may never know, 
But the ruins of some ancient civilization are here, buried under a 250-foot layer of ash and pumice that covered the island 3,500 years ago. Was this the end of the beginning? The moment when all advanced forms of technology and culture vanished from Earth? Could their destruction be remembered now only as myths? Might such myths extend even beyond the Earth to incredibly dim memories of catastrophes suffered on other planets? Light years from our sun, in the constellation of Baudis, there is a red giant called Epsilon. It is circled by a planet that may once have supported life. Some scientists believe that a space probe was sent from that planet toward the Earth. They believe the probe received these signals in 1927. They were the first radio signals sent from Earth into space. These echoes have a different delay pattern. There is no natural explanation for the difference. Duncan Lunan of the British Interplanetary Society has interpreted the echo pattern as a message from the space probe, a message from a dying planet in Epsilon Bautis. The star has become what we call a red giant. If we look at this painting here, it can illustrate the point. Um, what has happened is that the star has exhausted its um, uh, reserves of hydrogen in its core. Uh, in this situation, the inhabitants of the planetary system would find themselves in uh, real danger. They, uh, their, their own planet would get hotter. In time, all the planets would get very hot. Um, they, they would have, in other words, to perfect first interplanetary and then interstellar travel in order to, to get away from the sun. It's possible that uh, in the course of our history, in, in the last uh, 13,000 years, that uh, ships from Epsilon Botis have come here, have uh, conducted survey missions, possibly even had sm uh, small settlements established here for a time and pulled out again. It is possible that visitors from Epsilon Bautis arrived 13,000 years ago. Perhaps a city in Peru, abandoned 3,000 years ago, was the base. It once held 100,000 people. Why did they flee? We will never know. For they left nothing of themselves, no trace of their presence, except a silent city of mud walls. Might they have been colonists recalled to base in the face of an impending catastrophe? What happened here on this windy plain halfway between the sea and the sky? The only witness is a mute stone god who looks out at the ruins of a once great civilization and weeps. It has been estimated there exist 50,000 civilizations more advanced than the one we know. If only one of those civilizations saw its sun dying, it could have seeded the Earth. Someday, somewhere in the galaxies, we may encounter life that is remarkably similar to ourselves, and we will be able to confirm that the faint traces of ancient mysteries are the imprints of our ancestors from space. Once upon a time, there were three beautiful mannequins who lived in a little boutique. Every day they were dressed in the most beautiful clothes in the world, and they should have been very happy. But alas, they were very sad, because something was always missing. A different watch for every different look they wore. And so one night, when they were all alone,
our story is. We haven't met a girl yet who doesn't think the Timex wardrobe of watches is a fabulous idea, especially at Timex prices. <laughs> has been in space since 1957, when the Russians first orbited a grapefruit-sized satellite called Sputnik. Since then, men have walked upon the moon and lived in laboratories that orbit the space between the Earth and the moon. Soon, we shall reach out to the other planets of our solar system, and then to the stars. But even before men ever dreamed of space travel, they reported on visitors from space and to this moment, the reports continue. Are the most recent UFO sightings evidence of continued alien interest in the Earth? Is someone in space still watching the descendants of a colony sent to Earth thousands of years ago? program was brought to you by Timex, the dependable watch, precision made to wear with confidence. Timex, the fashionable watch, styled to wear with pride. Two important reasons why more people buy Timex than any other watch in the world. Ray Stevens is host for another All-Star Music Country USA tonight. When I moved here to Santa Cruz, I found a job. I needed transportation, but I didn't have enough money for a car. I had no recent credit references, and no one in town knew me very well. I went to Crocker Bank. They took enough time to check my history. That established my credit, and I got the money for the car. Crocker Bank. Ready to listen, ready to help. Mother, of Please, course... Please, why are you calling her, Sir Worley? I know she's up now, and it's cheaper to call before 8 in the morning. That's right. When you dial long-distance calls without operator assistance before 8 in the morning, for less than a dollar, you can talk to anywhere within California for six minutes or to New York for four minutes. Charlie, Mother's got a great idea. With all the money we're saving on these calls, we could fly her out here. He can't wait to see you. He just thinks it's great. Oh, I'm so...